Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if you would give this youth man slash Tony season in band a big hand. And you can return back to your seats, but stay standing because I'm going uh, I'm to read the word today. First off, I want to say, and I know I always say it, but it's still just as true as the first time I ever said it. First of all, I love this church. I love what I get to do. I love our pastors. I think this place is one of the greatest places on earth. It blows my mind. <laughs> We're in the middle of Ball, Louisiana, and God has just planted a gold mine here. Uh, but it's something so special. As you talk with people and as you, you know, just interact with different churches, you realize that we have the creme de la creme. This is the top tier. We have the best pastors, the best people, the best leaders in this church. And so I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this because this church has been instrumental in discipling me and raising me in my life. And as I was in worship today, I just couldn't help but thank him for the people that he's put around me because this church is absolutely incredible. And I'm, I'm so thankful to be here. So thankful to be able to do what we do here, to feel his presence. We don't deserve that. But the fact that he shows up right in the middle of a service, what an amazing thing that God's presence would be with us. It's awesome. And if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Um, I, last first Wednesday I heard I was a little long-winded, okay? <laughs> Not going to tell you who told me, right? <laughs> I heard. I'm going to try to keep it short, but my uh, if you're in youth, you know I'm going to try, right? Like, we'll, tr we'll try. Give it my best shot, okay? Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. First of all, let me give you some context. Um, in the Old Testament, it's almost comical how miserably the people of God failed to maintain righteousness. Every attempt to obey the law and maintain righteousness ended in absolute failure. I want you to go in the Old Testament and just read it. And first of all, empathize with them because it had been us too, right? Like, I'm glad y'all lived in and not me because it's hard, but it's just, it ends in abysmal failure. Like, it's just going to fall on its face every time. Uh, the people continued to prove that they're not able to be righteous on their own. They weren't able to maintain it on their own, right? It's just the cycle that they found themselves in and, and humanity needed redemption. And so you have to understand that in order to understand the prophecy and the hope that Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 gave to the people. Because what they understood was there was always this attempt to be righteous, but never, ever the ability to actually continue to follow through with it. It was always landing on their faces, always a failure to launch. And so when they would read Isaiah 61 and they learned that there was going to be somebody, somebody who would give hope to that cycle, it meant something to them. So I want to read that, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And this is talking about Jesus. If you know, Jesus actually quotes this. This is about him. This is about the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. There was going to be a Messiah that's coming who was able to actually be the righteousness that we can never be, who was actually going to give hope to people, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the cloak of praise instead of disheartened spirit. And this is the part I want to focus on. So they will be called oaks of righteousness. If I say oaks of righteousness, and it's exactly what you think. It's an oak. It's an oak tree. Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So up until this point, we've got what I imagine is a failure to launch righteous trees there's not one person that's able to actually be the righteousness that they're supposed to be and so what Jesus came to be was he became the perfect example what it looks like to take care of people what it looks like to love people what it looks like to be righteousness that we we couldn't be on our own and what he's saying is that I am doing this because what I want to do 
is I want to raise up a body of people who are oaks of righteousness. And what does that mean? He became the perfect example of righteousness, preaching good news to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted, releasing spiritual captives, and freeing spiritual prisoners to change the narrative for the people of God. And that's us. When he came, he changed the narrative. We see at the end of Isaiah 61 what his plan was all along. I'm going to show them what righteousness truly is. And what I imagine Jesus is doing is he's modeling righteousness as he's planting good seed in us. As we read about him, as we study his life, as we watch how he dealt with the broken and the hurting and the poor, every little word spoken, every action taken, another chance for us to receive that seed of righteousness. Nobody up until that point was able to give us the perfect seed of righteousness. Nobody was able to show us how to do it. Jesus comes along. He's the perfect example. And as we learn about him, it's a chance to receive that seed of righteousness. It's a chance to see that's how it's supposed to be done. And if we receive that, well, we can become that through him. But why did he do that? Because he wanted the people of God to be called oaks of righteousness. The sense of this idea that we will be oaks of righteousness is that we will have a sturdy righteousness able to withstand the test of time whether hardship and pestilence in a world full of brokenness pestilence and spiritual famine and confusion jesus had a plan all along to have a people who will be established and planted as symbols of righteousness again people that could never do that and what I imagine is that there were people that attempted to grow and to be oaks of righteousness but it just never could happen it had to be exemplified there had to be somebody that went before us that made us righteousness that we couldn't be on our own and it was so that me and you could be now symbols oaks of righteousness again I believe he wanted to bring back the trees of righteousness bring back the trees of righteousness so what I want to do today is I want to pray and I want y'all to pray with me that God would just reveal to us exactly what he's trying to say through his word and what he wants to do through this word tonight so why don't you pray with me father in the name of Jesus I thank you for your word I am in love with your word I pray tonight God that you would give me the ability to articulate exactly what it is that you want from us tonight God And I pray, Lord, that this word will begin to stir on somebody's heart and begin to teach us exactly what it is, God, that you want from us, God, so that we can begin to grow and to mature into these oaks of righteousness that you have called that are planted by you and by your hands, God. And tonight, God, I'm going to give you all the glory and all the praise for it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, before you're seated, tell somebody, hey, give them a high five, shake somebody's hand, and then you can be seated. I see y'all being obedient. Praise God. So I was really spiritual just now. I'm about to whiplash you like I always do. I'm going to be honest tonight. Uh, My favorite movies to watch are typically the ones that your kids like to watch. We, I would... I would love to have a movie night and us sit around and watch Finding Nemo all night. Okay, I would love it. Uh, You can ask my family. I'm obsessed. Uh, The plots are cute. The music's cute. It's just a good time all around, right? Like, kids' movies are where it's at. All that ratchet stuff they're playing now, give me the children's movies. I like that G-rate. It's good. It's good. But one of my all-time favorites uh, is that movie, The Lorax. How many of you have ever seen that? Some moms in here were just, hey, listen, I've seen it way too many times. I have the songs memorized. Don't try me on it. I will show you up, okay? They got one song on there. It's called How Bad Can I Be? It turns up every time it comes on. Like, I'm, I'm done. But you might not get spiritual when you watch children's movies, but that's why we're not the same because I do, right? And if you watch children's movies, I'm telling you, they'll preach. Okay, I've sat down a couple times and been like, amen. I'm watching Winnie the Pooh, amen. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I can't help. (laughs) Look, the Lorax will preach. I've known I'm going to use it in a sermon in a while, but I'm telling you, I couldn't get it off my mind, so I'm going to tell you how it preaches tonight and how this ties in. Uh, But if you've ever seen it, I'm going to do a one-minute summary of the plot. Okay, I need to go watch it. I'll plug it but I'll give you a summary. I won't spoil anything, okay? But <laughs> what happens is there's a money-hungry man who found a way to sell a good product with trees. 
He ends up cutting all the trees, and the city has to artificially curate the air and the trees that are around. That's wild. Uh, There are a few people that are concerned with bringing back the trees, like only a few people that actually care about the trees. Um, But the only way to get the trees back is to replant a seed. And it's really hard, you find, whenever there's artificial ground and artificial soil and artificial trees and all of the artificial things to actually replant the seeds. But for the last 30 minutes of the movie, they are dialed into what's happening with the seed. Okay? And they find a man that has the last seed left on earth. That was the money-hungry man at the beginning. They get the seed. They work against every opposition that wants to stop the growth of the tree. There's this really short... uh, the short man with a bob in the movie. That's essential. Go watch it. Uh, <laughs> they find a place in the middle of the city. They break up the hard ground and plant that last little seed into the ground. And then the whole, so- the whole city joins together in a unified effort to protect and to raise the seed. That's amazing. It's a real kumbaya moment, okay? They, they sing this really cute song at the end. It's amazing. And you see the little, the little tree growing. And then the last few minutes, they pan out, and you see all of these beautiful little saplings of trees that have been planted everywhere because they protected the seed. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, I cried for something. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't. <laughs> but if you want to bring back the trees, you have to focus on protecting, planting, and maintaining the seed, Okay. And the same is true in a spiritual sense, right? I told you that movie would preach. Big oaks of righteousness, they start with small seeds. Start with very small seeds. If you're going to be oaks of righteousness, we first have to learn how to take care of the seed that's been given to us. Seed planting comes from Him. I told you before that He is the example. He's the one that plants. Isaiah literally says that He's the one that plants. He's the one that gives the good seed. That's His job. That's the work that He's responsible for. But you know what our job is in this process is that we have to make sure that we are good ground for that seed to grow. So the gardening, the dirt work, the aspect of gardening that's not very fun, that makes sure that that seed's taken care of, that's our job. Seed throwing is his, but seed growing is our job. Our job is the dirt work. And for the rest of the time, I want to focus on the dirt work required for bringing back the oaks of righteousness that requires us to take care of the seeds of righteousness. Okay, because if you want big oaks, that's the end result. You've got to focus on the seed. The most essential part of seed growth is dirt work. And you understand this if you've ever done gardening. How many of you are successful gardeners? Don't raise your hand if you kill plants, but how many of you know how to raise a tomato, right? Anybody? I I see some of you. I'll be calling you after this. (laughs) I'm not. Don't ask me to raise a garden. You don't want that. I will kill it. But here's the thing. I do know a few things about gardening. First things first, if you're going to plant a seed, you don't just throw seed on the ground. What do you have to do? You've got to work the dirt. Okay? Seeds don't just magically happen, which is sad because I wish it did. I'd be perfect at it. That's all. I throw seed everywhere, right? But it's just not how it happens. You've got to be willing to put in dirt work if you want seeds to grow. That's just how it happens. Seeds will never come into full maturity without the proper groundwork for it to be laid on. Okay, so let's talk about that dirt work required. Matthew 13, 3 through 9, I know that you guys have probably heard this before, but I'm telling you, I felt like this is what God wanted me to teach on tonight. And this is a parable that you're very familiar with, but I'm going to break it down tonight. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and they ate them up. Other seed fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil and they sprang up immediately because they had no depth of soil. But after the sun rose, they were scorched and became, because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up, choked them out. But others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some hundred, some sixty, some thirty times as much. The one who has ears, let him hear. So what Jesus was doing, he was telling a parable. First of all, if you go read that, the disciples are kind of getting frustrated. Like, why are you always telling stories? Just be straight up. I want to know what you're saying. And he gives an explanation that we're going to go through. But the difference between seeds that mature and seeds that fail in the process was completely contingent on the ground that the seed falls on. This is not revelatory, but this is something we have to understand. It is completely contingent on the ground that it falls on. 
In this passage, Jesus makes it very simple. The seed that will thrive and survive are the seeds that are landed on ground that has intentionally been made ready for the seed. It had to have intentionally been worked and ready for the seed in order for that seed to grow. Likewise, the only seeds of righteousness that will grow are the ones that land on the people who have intentionally made their hearts and their spirits ready to receive. Because gardening gardening is not something that happens on accident. Good ground has to be intentionally cultivated. Good ground has to be made within our hearts and in our spirits, and that is our job. That is something that we have to work on. Matthew 13 also shows us how we get the ground ready, and I want us to take a look at it, and I'm going to break it down. Matthew 13, 18 through 23, this is where he gives the explanation. I'm kind of glad that the disciples pressed him on, like, explain this. Because I wanted the explanation too, so I'm not that mad, but it was funny how he kind of rebuked them. Like, people that can't hear, they won't hear. But if you have ears, hear. And he was basically telling them, some people will never understand. And he gives them the explanation, so I'm glad. It says this, listen then to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is the one sown with seed beside the road. The one sown with seed on the rocky places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. When affliction or persecution occurs because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one sown with seed among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one with seed on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundred, some sixty, some thirty times as much. So we see the explanations there. We see the explanations of what happens. So what is the one that looks like good ground? Well, let's first go through the ones that weren't. Number one, we have got to prepare the ground. If we don't want to be the first seed, we have to prepare the ground. It says, and he told them many things in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seeds but fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. And this was the explanation for it. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one sown with seed beside the road. So there are two things about the first seed and ground that I want us to take note of. Number one, the ground that the seed fell on just wasn't prepared in any way to receive it or understand it. The first ground, there was no dirt work done. The first ground just was not ready. Okay, You can throw it on there, but it's not going to receive it because it doesn't want to receive it. It's not made to receive. It wasn't worked. And number two, the thing I want us to take note of, there were birds waiting to snatch the seed as soon as they saw it. Okay, the ground was hard and uncultivated and in no way ready to receive it. And this is what happens whenever we hear the word, but our hearts and our spirits have not been moved. Our hearts and our spirits have not in any way been prepared through the week. This is the reason why sometimes we can go to church, we can hear the word of God, and we can be in services, but in no way be moved by what's going on because our hearts have not been prepared. Our hearts have not been cultivated. Hosea 10 and 12, he prays this beautiful prayer to the people of Israel. And this is what he's telling them. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Break up your fallow ground. What is fallow ground? It is land that is left idle for a season after plowing, harrowing. So it's just been left idle. What happens is the ground becomes hardened over time because it's been, just been left idle and unmoved for a while. It's just been left idle. Seek God and become spiritually active again. Because here's the thing. There are hearts in this room, that, and life has a way of doing this to us, that as life happens... Sometimes we become callous to the presence of God. Sometimes we become hardened to the things that are going on around us and we become so numb and so callous that we're no longer able to be moved anymore by what's happening around us. And this is what Hosea tells them. It's time to seek God and become spiritually active again, people of God. 
It is time to become spiritually active again, to stir ourselves up and ensure that our hearts do not become hardened to the things of God. Here's a good test for you, and if you have fellow ground, can God still move me? Does God still have the ability to move me? How long has it been since I've been moved by the presence of God? How long has it been since I've actually sat in His presence and maybe been convicted? How long has it been that, that God was able to speak to me to do something and I actually listened to Him? How long has it been since you've been moved by God? Because what happens with fallow ground is it's, it's not been moved. It's just sat idle. And the same thing happens when we go spiritually dormant. When we go spiritually idle. And when God's not able to move us anymore, what we see happen is that we become spiritual fallow ground that's not able to receive. Because we have not been moved. And this is the thing that I'm so afraid of is that being in church for so long. This is something I never want to fall prey to is that as I sit in services, as I sit and I listen to the Word of God, it no longer has an effect on me. I've heard that. I don't need to hear it again. I've sat through those songs. I don't need to do this again. I've been in worship services, and we just become unfaced. I never want to be in that place. I always want to be a place where the presence of God can move me. You find that anytime Jesus moved, it says in the Gospels that Jesus was moved with compassion. And so there's something that happened there that Jesus was still able to be moved. There's a spiritual awakening, a spiritual activeness that is still able to be moved. And I never want to become the fallow ground that's not able to be moved. Because if I'm going to be like Jesus, I have to be movable. I've got to be able to respond to him. I have to be able to hear him. I want to be able to feel his presence. I want to be able to respond when the word of God goes forth. I don't want to be numb to these things. I want to be ready. And there's a, a prayer that I've continued to pray over myself, over the students that are in this church, is that God would replace every heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. We read in Ezekiel that that was his prayer for the people, is that he would remove every heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. I don't ever want to be a place that is just calloused and unmoved, but something that is absolutely receptive and movable by God. And that has been my prayer. And my prayer is all of those hard and unmoved places, God, break them up. Break them up. We do that in His presence. Okay, so a lot of times what we don't feel here is probably because we don't feel it when we leave. So if we're not in His presence outside of this place, when we come in this place, don't expect to just all of a sudden... Because there has to be something on the outside of this place. And so as we get in the presence of God, I want us to be in that place where we say, God, break up my fallow ground. Ask Him to move you. Ask Him to stir you again. This might be a message for somebody that sat on a pew for a very long time and not been moved in a long time. Because I don't care how long you've gone to church. I really I don't care how many years. Are you still producing fruit is my question. And anytime somebody comes to me with how many years they've gone to church, I'm not hating. Listen, that's an amazing thing. I'm glad that you're still here. Please, like, that's an amazing thing. But it doesn't matter how many years you've gone to church. If you stop producing fruit, then you've lost your place. Because that's the place that God's called us to be. It's fruit-bearing, movable people. Even if I'm still kicking at 90 years old, I want to be movable by God. Even if I'm still here years down the road, I want God to still look at me and say that that heart is ready for me to move. So we've got to prepare the ground. We've got to break up the fallow ground. We've got to stir up ourselves. And maybe at that altar call, that's what God's wanting you to do tonight is to stir yourselves up again in his presence. But that's what needs to happen because good seed will just fall and not be planted and not grow if it falls on fallow ground. The second thing I want us to take note of before we move on to the next uh, seed is that we have to beware because birds are coming for the seed. Birds are coming for the seed. Okay, I wanted to say this. I felt the, very, the, the need to say this, but it is no secret that you have an active enemy that does not want to see you grow and produce fruit for the kingdom of God. That's no secret. Okay, if you're new to this, and even if you aren't, you need to be aware that there is something that is trying to steal the seed from you. This is the reason why, and if you've been living for God, you know this. When you start living for God, it's like all hell breaks loose on your family. 
And you, but you probably shaking your heads because you know this happened. So when I decided to start living for God, the bottom of hell opened up and every, everything that they had started coming for the seed. This is the thing that happens. The bird will come for the seed. The bird will come for the seed. That's what's happening is that God wants to do a work in you and in your family. God wants to grow something. God wants to grow in your marriage. God wants to grow in your children. God wants to do a fruitful work in your family. And hell does not like that because it's an act of opposition against what he's trying to do. And so we have got to be aware that the seed is trying to be stolen, but our focus should not be on that. Just keep focusing on that seed that's been given. Don't let the enemy steal it from you, intimidate you from planting it, because I found that that's a thing too, that new people most of the time do not want to continue to do this because they're like, if I continue to do this, is hell going to continue to go after me? Probably. But is it worth it? Yes. Let me read this, Matthew 13, 31 through 32. This is another parable. This is so revelatory for somebody in somebody's family right now. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. That makes no sense if you don't understand what's going on. See, those same birds that were coming for the seed, if you'll allow God to continue to water that seed, and you'll allow God to continue to grow you, and you'll stay planted, and you'll stay doing the dirt work, and you'll stay faithful to this. I know it seems like hell is breaking loose on your family and on your mind right now, but if you will stay planted, this is what's going to happen. It says this, those same birds that once were able to snatch that seed like that no longer will have a hold on you. They'll be resting in your branches because God's going to raise up your family in such a way that those things that once got a hold of you, the things that once had a hold on your family, no longer because God wants to grow you. God wants to do something so beautiful inside of your family. And this is the same thing we see whenever we, uh, whenever the Isaiah is talking about that the anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. That word there for anointing is fatness. What happens is, I've used this example in in the youth, Uh, whenever my dog was growing, I had to literally every single night, I would take my two fingers under his under his neck because his little body was growing so much that if I didn't check, his collar was going to choke him out because homeboy grew a lot in the first year. I have a golden retriever, if anybody didn't know that. Um, So what happens is that same, I want you to think of that with that same concept with that yoke of bondage. Those things that once had a hold on you and your family. Okay? As you begin to grow, As the anointing comes, as you begin to grow in your faith, that anointing breaks that yoke of bondage because what happens is, is that God grows you and matures you so much that those things can't fit anymore. So those same yokes of bondage that once held you back, that once had a stronghold on you, if you will allow God to continue to grow you, I'm telling you that the promise of the word of God is that same yoke of bondage eventually will have no hold if you stay planted. If you stay planted. Keep your eyes on what you're growing, okay? Keep your eyes on what you're growing and know that this is worth it. This is worth it. Okay, so we have to prepare the ground, number one, and number two, we have to prioritize the seed. It says this, others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. They sprang up immediately because they had no depth of soil. But after the sun rose, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. The one sown with seed on the rocky places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution occurs because of the word, immediately he falls away. So the second one didn't grow much because there was no firm root. And this is what happens. And you'll see this a lot in churches that there are people that will come here and I'm so glad that this happens. I don't ever want to discourage this because this is a good thing. This means they did receive seed. But what you'll find is that people get really on fire and like ignited for this. And like, I'm ready to go. Like, let's do all the things. And they want to go ahead first. But all it is... Is just this immediate hit of joy and excitement, which is a great thing because that's the fire of God. I I like that. But what happens is if that same person that's ignited in a church service doesn't go home and grow root, 
then it's going gonna, it's gonna to fade away. Because excitement can only sustain you for so long. And so what I want us to see here with roots is that that is the unseen growth that is happening when the tree is growing. The deeper that a root grows, the stronger that it will be, and the more it will be able to resist and to stand against the tribulations that come against it. While it may be the unseen things, it is the most vital part of producing fruit. Root growing is the most vital part to producing fruit. The most vital part. Oaks are known for the big and strong roots. And if we're going to be fruitful and strong standing oaks of righteousness, we have to make up in our mind that we're going to develop really deep and strong roots as well. Because excitement can't contain me or cannot sustain me for very long. So let me be even more practical. What are we doing when we are alone is even more important than what we do when we're with other believers. The unseen growth. What you're doing when you're alone is just as important as what you do when you're with believers. We must have strong and deep secret places of prayer. We must have strong and deep secret places of study. We must have strong and deep places of worship because what happens is when we begin to get into our secret place, it's the unseen growth. It's growth that y'all have no idea that I'm doing that. Growth that nobody's going to be able to pat you on the back and give you recognition for, but growth that is essential. What's happening is it's in that secret place when you're in prayer and when you're communing with God and when you're in His Word and you're learning about Him, you're learning about the character of God. And when you're in worship and you're stirring up that ground, what's happening is roots are growing that are unseen to people but that are absolutely vital to sustaining us through tribulation and through hardships. Because here's what's going to happen if you do not grow roots is that trials will uproot you. Trials will uproot you. Trials always reveal root systems. They always reveal root systems. We know the ones that have roots. And it's not because they came up and told, I've been reading my Bible for two hours. I've been worshiping every day. No, we'll know. We'll know the ones that have roots. Because what's going to happen is that trial, persecution, fire is going to come against your family. Things that you had no idea you were going to have to face are coming in. It's like hurricanes and tornadoes and spiritual storms. You're like, what's going on? But you're rooted. And those that have no roots, they'll get uprooted. But those that have built that place, that secret growth, that thing that nobody else sees, I'm telling you, you'll know because trials are going to come and they're going to be unmovable. It's like, man, you shouldn't be here. That, that, that thing that came against your family should have taken you out. Yeah, but it didn't because I have roots and I know who my God is. And it wasn't just this initial hit of excitement. It was something that's so much deeper than that. But this is not just a message for the new Christian. It's, it's for all of a secret place will keep you. It will keep you when the world around you is being hammered on. We have to continue to water those roots. This is not something that I ever want to stop practicing. I said that with the last thing, and I'm going to say it with this one. This is not anything that I ever want to become accustomed to, but I continue to want to grow deeper. Is my mindset, my mindset in the kingdom of God is I want more. I just want more. I want more. It's not enough. Living for God for 12 years, that's not enough. I want to be doing this for the rest of my life. I want to continue to grow deeper, continue to allow that root to take place in my life. It doesn't matter how long we've been in this, we cannot forsake the secret place. None of us get a pass at that. Every single one of us have to have places of prayer and worship outside of this place or we're not growing roots. We cannot forsake that. So we prepare the ground, we prioritize the seed, and then, number three, we pluck out the weeds. It says this, Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. So what happened with that seed? This is what happens. The one sown with seed among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, And the anxiety of the world and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So what we notice about this one is that it actually had the ability to grow a little bit. But the growth got choked out by the weeds. Weed pulling is a continual process. Every season, every garden, if you're going to maintain a healthy garden, you have to become acquainted with pulling out weeds because gardens don't grow 
if there are weeds. You have to become acquainted with pulling out weeds. And what we have to notice is that living with weeds will eventually take over fruitfulness. Oaks of righteousness cannot live with weeds of unrighteousness. Oaks of righteousness cannot live with weeds of unrighteousness. And the thing that kind of scares me about this is that it's able to grow. It's taken root. It's, it's hit the ground. It's all the way in. But something happened. I wasn't diligent to maintain the garden to pull out the weeds. So what happens is the fruitfulness is taken over. And I can no longer grow because I wasn't diligent to take out the weeds of unrighteousness. This is a part of sanctification. As we begin to grow in God, we need to go into a prayer room, go into the Word of God, and begin to examine the unrighteous things in our lives that can be stifling our fruitfulness. Colossians 3, 5-11, through this is what it tells us to do. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is what it's talking about. Pull out the weeds. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in your life you once lived before you were an oak of righteousness, before you got the seed. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self and its practice and put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. If you are a human, you are also built with the tendency to produce weeds because every single one of us have flesh. Every single one of us battles things like this. And as you're going through that list, I'm sure that there are some things that you can see, I've had a problem with that. I've dealt with that. But what happens is, is if we do not uproot those things and get those weeds out of our life, they will stifle our fruitfulness. And this is something that has to be a continual process for us. You never get out of the weed pulling business. I'm going to let you know. Because just as soon as you pull one out, here come another. And that's what sanctification is. I've talked about it before, but it's literally this continual process of, hey, this is stifling my growth. And as you begin to grow and as you go deeper in the Word of God, you'll find that there are things that, hey, I once lived with that thing. I once lived with that weed. That used to be okay when I was a baby Christian. But as we grow and mature, those things that once had a hold on us have have to get thrown out. They have to get thrown out. It's the weed pulling. Because if we do not, we will be unfruitful. Jonathan Edwards explains it like this. I have resolved whenever I do any conspicuously evil action to trace it back until I come to the original cause and then both carefully endeavor to do so no more and fight and pray with all my might against the original of it. So what happens is that when we find that there are things and weeds that begin to pop up in our life, my goal is to make sure I'm not living with that thing. It's this active process of weed pulling, that when those things begin to poke their head up at me, I'm going to pluck them out. I'm going to the root of it, and it will not live with me anymore. So after you've prepared the ground, broken up the fallow ground, you've prioritized the seeds and started establishing roots, you've been diligent to pluck out the weeds. You've done the groundwork. After you've done those things, after we've been in that process, the fourth thing I want to talk about is just practice patience because fruit is on its way. Practice patience. But the one sown with seed on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times as much. Fruit is only produced in people who are willing to persevere through the growth process. And this is not a revelatory thing, but this is so true. If you were to plant an oak seed right now in your backyard, and you were to cultivate and do all those things, you're not waking up the next morning expecting to go out there and there'd be a big tree. That would be scary, okay? But it doesn't happen like that. Growth is such a patient process because there are times where God's wanting to do something in you and God's growing something in you and you don't see the fruit of it. And it's frustrating because you're like, God, why can't I see that yet? But be patient. Be patient because fruit is on its way. Likewise, we are patient and diligent with the seed of righteousness that God has given us, understanding that if we are diligent with the groundwork, that fruit will grow. Galatians 6, 6 through 8, it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. 
For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. If we do not become weary. And there is somebody in this room who needs to be encouraged by that because you've been living for God and you've been, you've been working at this thing and you've been doing this and you're like, God, when is this going to prove to be fruitful to me? And I'm telling you, God is saying, you will reap if you faint not. If you will wait on that seed to take root, if you will allow me to continue to work, if you will continue to cultivate that ground, continue to pull out that weeds, I'm telling you, you will reap if you faint not. And somebody in this room needs to be encouraged that God is not done yet. God is not done yet. God's not done with our families. He's not done with us. He's not done with this church. There have been seeds that have been sown that if we will be patient and diligent with the groundwork that He's given us, I'm telling you, fruit is on its way. It's the promise of the Word of God. We will reap. When you sow into the Spirit, it is worth it. It is worth it. It is always worth it. I know it doesn't seem like it right now. Because you don't see the fruitfulness yet, but I'm telling you, what God's wanting to do, and I could just see it when I was in prayer, is that our families would be oaks of righteousness. And when I saw that, I saw people that were growing so much in the Spirit, people that were growing deeper and growing stronger so much so that they were symbols of righteousness to a world around them that's in, that's in famine, that is in spiritual pestilence, that has no access to righteousness. What God is going to do is He is going to raise up people in a church that stand as examples for what it looks like to be righteous in a very unrighteous world. To be people who know the truth and know the Word of God in a place that knows no truth and does not know what God has spoken. That's what He wants to do inside of us. If we will allow Him to grow those things in us. And you can stand. I'm closing. I want to say that Tree growing is a beautiful process, but dirt work is no fun. Dirt work is no fun. And what we have to be diligent to do is to be okay with God doing something in us and breaking up some areas in our life that haven't been broken up in a while and pulling some weeds out of us and doing things that we we hadn't done in a while. Hebrews 12 and 11, it says this, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, I know this to be very true, okay? (laughs) No discipline seems amazing. But later, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So no dirt work is fun at first. But oaks of righteousness don't grow overnight. And if we're going to be trees of righteousness, we have to be diligent with that dirt work. And what the altar call was going to be tonight, and this is what I felt on Sunday before I wrote this message, is that it's going to be spiritual dirt work. And look, I don't know what that looks like. It might be that, hey, God, I need you to stir me up again and move me and break up my fallow ground. Because as that word was going forth, I knew that that was me. I haven't been moved in a while. God, break up the fallow ground. Maybe it's that you need to go in and pull out some of those weeds that have been stifling. Maybe it's that God show me how to grow roots. Show me what I need to do because I I know that my secret place has nothing, no root system. We cannot allow the seeds that are going forth from God to just land on fallow ground. We cannot afford for them to just go unplanted because God wants to do something in your life. God wants to do something in your marriage, and your family and we've got to be receptive to that. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to open up the altars for dirt work. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be dirt work. And it's going to be us examining our hearts in the presence of God and allowing Him to speak. And I know this wasn't a super deep message, but it was what I felt like God wanted to speak to us tonight. And as they begin to sing, we're going to pray. And I want us to just open up our ear to heaven. God, what is it that you want to do in my family? In Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the seeds of righteousness, God, that you have planted inside of us, inside of this church, inside of families. Lord, I pray that you would begin to stir up some individual, God, that hasn't been stirred in a while. God, that you would break up the fallow ground that has stifled and idled us for too long. God, I never want to be unfruitful. I never, ever want to be a heart of stone. I want to be a heart of flesh. So, God, if I haven't been moved in a while, move me. If I haven't been stirred in a while, stir me, God. 
I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give somebody roots, God, that somebody would gain a love for your word, a love for your presence, a love for the things of God more than the things of this world to the point where they grow roots, God, that are able, God, to sustain them when trials come. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to show us those weeds, those things, God, that are keeping us from going deeper, those things, God, that are keeping us from fruitfulness, God, and continue to just work on us, God. Whatever you want to do in this room, God, I want you to do. I want you to pour out your presence in this place. I want you to stir up this church, God, and begin to do what only you can do in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to open up these altars. We can pray today, and I just want you to, it to be you and God. Whatever God wants to do in you, Allow him to do that today. If you want somebody to pray with you, we're here to pray with you. But let's just make this place a place where our hearts and our minds are getting ready for what God wants.
Let's give the Lord praise in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, break up some fallow ground. Pull up some weeds. Establish roots. Do a work in us tonight, God. We will not allow the enemy to steal from us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I did do some yard work. I wasn't planting tomatoes and bell peppers, though. Gigi says we can't do that. We have to plant flowers and shrubs and rose bushes. And, and Mr. Paul, he helps me every now and then. And when you plant a rose bush with Mr. Paul, you think you're going to drown it. Because he puts way a whole lot of water in his man. It's got to be, a, it, you know why? Because that soil down in there has got to get really, really prepared for what's got to happen. And you want those roots to come down to the bottom of that thing and, and begin to grow and to seek what is in that soil down there. And it's the soil work that is the work. It's the soil work that's the job. And you, you put a little bit of that time-release fertilizer in there and you, and, and you make sure that everything is out of the way so that what you're planting down in there can thrive. Amen? And so tonight, I will tell you, we are all walking a spiritual walk. That we're all in a battle. We've all had things try to come and tear down and destroy and push against our lives. And it is our job as the gardeners of our souls to continue to dig up that fallow ground, to, to continue to, to, to let those roots go down, and also to make sure there's nothing else coming up around there. And everything that's coming up around there, you pull it up by the roots. Amen. Don't just cut it off. You pull it up by the roots. Amen. And I'll tell you, some things will begin to flourish. Some things will begin to grow. Amen. And if we're not growing, if we're not moving forward, and we're not going where we think God should be taking us, then we, we need to maybe do some soil work. Amen. Do, do some dirt work in your life. And see what happens from there. And I believe God's going to bless the rest of it. Amen. What a beautiful message tonight, Faith. A lot to learn from tonight. Lord, we thank you for this tonight. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this word tonight. We pray your blessings on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Is Kenzie still in here? Is Kenzie still in here? There she is. She's got that brand new baby with her tonight. First time that little girl has been in church tonight. Uh, Y'all get by there and see if she's a doll. Amen. Huh? That's right. Gigi says, look, but don't touch. Amen. And, uh, so thank you for uh, being here tonight on, on First Wednesday worship. Excited for what God's doing. Amen. I'll see you Sunday morning. We're going to have a great time in the Lord around here Sunday. Amen. I feel like I've already leaning into something that God's got his hand on. And I believe it's going to be incredible in this place Sunday morning.